Hey, good morning, Bridgepoint. We welcome those who are with us online as well. If you are brand new with us, my name is Jared. I am the teaching pastor here. Let me begin by, by, by just asking you this. All right, I want you to think of these words, busy and tired. How many of you would say that at least one of those applies to you? Anyone? Yep. Yeah. All right, here's what I want you to do. Help me out here. Turn to the person next to you and tell them whether it's tired, busy, both, or neither. Just take a moment. If anyone next to you said neither, can you just send them up here and they'll do my job? All right? Because they got something figured out that I don't. All right? We live in a fast-paced, high-demand culture that leaves all of us feeling probably tired and busy, right? I mean, think about your days. Just an average day, you, you wake up pretty early, you've got stuff to worry about, whether it's getting kids to childcare or school, um, delivering on projects, getting to work, like managing meetings, deliverables, whatever it is. And then you get home and the real work begins, right? It's chores, taking care of kids, getting them different places. It's trying to take care of your finances or make it to an appointment. And the next thing you know, you hit the sack and you start it all over again, right? A couple of years ago, my family went up to Storyland. It's this little amusement park for like elementary age kids and younger. It's pretty fun. The day we went, they're, they're, they were not very busy. And so my kids wanted to go on this ride. I, I can't remember the name, but it had spinning turtles. Okay. So like big turtle shells, you sit in it. And as the whole ride spins, your little turtle cart spins too. And so we get on it. We get like the 30 or 40 second ride. It stops and there's no line. And so the operator says, you want to keep going? And my kids say something before I can. They're like, yeah. And so he just hits the go button, right? And because there's no line, he just lets it run. And what started as a really fun and exciting experience turned in to me like, politely, excuse me, sir. I'd like, stop, please. You know, and eventually it escalates to, get me off this thing, right? <laughs> like, please, I'll do anything. Some of you probably feel like that's your life right now, right? <laughs> that you signed up for the ride. You got on. You took the job. You accepted the promotion. You bought the fixer-upper. You signed the kids up for sports leagues, both local and travel. You thought it was what you were supposed to do. It looked fun and exciting, like the right thing. And now, after a little bit of time, you were just holding on, begging for it to slow down. Right? Anybody there? You're looking for a break. We long for a different rhythm or pace to our lives. And that brings us to this series. We are starting the year in a series called Kickstart. We are looking at the rhythms in our lives that I believe lead us into what is good and best for us. We started last week by looking at what kind of rhythm we can implement every single day. We said that our lives can only be fruitful, our faith will only flourish when we're connected to Jesus, which requires us to be close to him. And the way that we are close to him is that we implement a rhythm of time with him through scripture and prayer every day. Try to make that happen so that his life, his power, his strength, his peace can flow into our lives and bear the fruit we want to see, right? So this week, we're going to get into our weekly rhythm. What are the things we can do every week to begin to experience the kind of faith and life that we long for? So if we look at the first generation of Christians, their story is told in the book of Acts. We studied the book of Acts for several weeks last summer. I want to read to you just a short excerpt. As the church is forming, taking shape, we read this in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. If you'd skip down in that same chapter, just a few verses to 46, it reads this, Every day, these are the first believers in Jesus, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That generation of believers and every generation since has put into practice two rhythms to their week. Every Sunday morning, they would gather together to worship God in honor of Jesus and in celebration of his resurrection. That's what we're doing right now. And in addition to that, in between Sundays of worship, they would meet in each other's homes to talk, 
to put things into practice, to love each other, to develop friendship, to be encouraged and nourished. We do that through small groups. So even years later, we we try to maintain that same rhythm of worship and community. It increases our faith. It brings joy and life to us. But here's the strange thing. Even for people who believe in these practices, this rhythm of worship and community, we are seeing people do this less, have a lower commitment to this than ever before. And by we, I don't mean bridge point. I just mean like in our culture in general, people are less consistent in worshiping God every week and they're more resistant to engaging in meaningful community. You go, I don't have time for that. I got stuff to do. I got home projects. I got errands to run. I need a break. And, and so what we're seeing is that there's less consistency in worship, more resistance or reluctance to community. And, and so some have hypothesize that maybe these ancient practices just don't fit in our culture, I'd like to offer a different suggestion. I think that maybe the problem is not with those practices at all, but maybe that we have forsaken or ignored another rhythm to our week that goes back much further and runs much deeper. We need a rhythm of rest to our lives that we are moving at a pace that does not allow margin to make room for the things that are most important to us, the things that have the greatest impact on us. And so today we are going to talk about implementing a rhythm of rest to our life. This will challenge you. It will stretch you. There will be times where you think, I'm not exactly sure if I'm even interested in doing that. But my hope is that you would be inspired to do it. And then you would start to understand how you and those in your household, your family can begin to implement a rhythm of rest that makes room for what's most important to you. Okay. And so here's where it all starts. The Bible begins with God working. First chapter of the first book of the Bible is God creating everything that was. Let me give you a glimpse of it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 starts like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. This begins this rhythm of work for God. It's described poetically through this series of days where God created everything that is. Created the sky and the the land below. He created the sun and the moon and the stars and plants and animals. And eventually he even created people in his image. This was work for God. If you've ever created anything, whether it's uh, like woodworking or a delicious meal or a masterpiece of art, maybe you wrote a poem or a term paper, like if you've ever created anything, you know that it takes energy and effort and exertion. This is true even for God. So God is at work. And by the end of his work, he steps back. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And we read this. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So it brings us to the end of God's accomplishment, the end of God's work. Everything that has been created is good, and he evaluates it as very good. It's this beautiful moment. And so before we move on, I just want to say this. Work is not the enemy. Sometimes it feels like the enemy, right? That it's what keeps you from everything good in life. That it's what keeps you from time with your kids and your family. It's what keeps you out of the home where you want to relax. It's what messes up all of your hobbies. And so sometimes we start to think that work is bad. But if God did it, it can't be all bad, right? So we were actually created for meaningful, purposeful, productive work, just like God did. It's part of your wiring. That's why a life without work, a life of laziness or unproductivity is not honoring to God. Work is not inherently bad. Here's the problem, though. Most of us have stopped just there, and the story continues. Listen to what happens next. It says in Genesis chapter 2, the story continues. It says, thus the heavens and the earth, they were completed in all their vast array. I mean, when you imagine the stars in the sky, the universes that haven't even been discovered, the depths of the oceans and the mountain peaks, it was all completed. It was perfectly created by God. And it says then this, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. 
That word rested is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means stop. To enjoy, to delight. It says, then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God rests. Think about this for a second. Why do you think God rested? You think he got to the end and he's like, whew, I am spent. I got to lay down for a little bit. That was just a little more than I can handle. I don't think so. Like we believe that God is infinite in every way. So there is no end to his power or his might or his imagination. There is no point where his fuel tank runs on fumes. Like he can keep going for all of eternity. So he stops, he rests for a different reason. He stops to enjoy what he created. See, he could have kept going. But it was only in the stopping, the pausing, that he, he was able to look around in delight in what he had accomplished. Think about that for a moment. God is not so proud that he refuses to enjoy what he has done. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone over to someone's house and they make this just exquisite meal. I mean, it's like this five-course meal that, that's laid out on the table from start to finish. It's just the best food you've ever eaten. There's dessert waiting for you on the stove. And with the first bite, you just make like that, oh man, this is so good, you know? And, and they go and they take a bite and they're like, oh, this is it, just something I whipped up. It's a little bland. Sorry about that. Like they, they refuse to enjoy what they've made. You know that? Like you've had that. God is not like that. He's not above going, oh man, this is good. Like when he creates the world, he steps back and he's like, y'all see this? This is so good. This is amazing. I'm amazing. I did this. And it sounds arrogant, but here's the thing. With God, it's not. He's just saying what is true, Right? He's just delighting in it, glorying in what he's done. And think about, the, think about the creation story up to this point. God is moving through. He goes, okay, I, cre I created land and sky. That's good. I created sun, stars, and moon. That's good. If you've ever gazed into a night sky, you know that's good. He creates plants, flowers, trees, shrubs. And he looks at it, he goes, that's good. Animals, good. People, good. Then he steps back. He goes, all of this is very good. And then he rests to delight in it, to appreciate it. And then he labels that moment in time something entirely different. He says, this is not just good or even very good. He says, this moment right here is holy, sacred, spiritual, divine. Because this moment where I am enjoying life in all its fullness, when I'm noticing the goodness and beauty of the world around me, this is holy. There's never been a moment like this. And in that moment, he memorializes it. He says, I want other people to experience this delight just like I am. I want them to enjoy what I am creating and the life that I am giving. They need to experience this too. And so he declares that this kind of rest is for all people, that everyone should enjoy it and experience it just like he did. And so in this, we understand something about this rhythm of rest. A rhythm of rest helps us enjoy the life God gives us. If you're going to write something down today, I'd like for you to write this down. A rhythm of rest helps us enjoy the life God gives us. I don't know all of your stories. I don't know all of your circumstances. I don't know what you're facing with work or with your family. I don't know if there's stress or frustration. I don't know if you're dealing with, with some health scares that are, that are a little bit disrupting right now. But here's what I do know. In every single one of our lives, there is goodness and beauty. I know that that's true. There is something good and beautiful around you. It may be people. It may be something that God has provided. It may be the product of your work that you have, have accomplished. Like there is something good and beautiful in each of our lives because God is there and he is at work. But here's the problem. When we continue to only work and not rest, we move at such a pace that keeps us from enjoying what's good and beautiful around us. I don't know if you've ever driven on like a scenic highway or interstate, you know, maybe up the coast or through the mountains of New Hampshire or Vermont or your favorite state park or national park. But, but as you're driving, 
And there, there's just beauty all around you. And there's always the temptation when I'm the one driving to just keep cruising at, at 55 miles an hour, but also like just looking at the mountain peaks, you know, or looking off into the ocean. And about the time that I, I cross over the dotted yellow line, I get a punch in the arm and then I, I steer back. And Rachel will tell me, if you want to enjoy the view, you got to stop. If you want to enjoy the view of life, if you want to be able to see the goodness and beauty that's all around you, you can't keep moving at this pace. You got to pull over. You got to slow down. You got to stop and turn your eyes to the people, the things, the home, even the work that is for your good and take a moment to just say, God, thank you, right? You got to stop. Doesn't that sound nice? to have a deeper awareness and appreciation for the good and beautiful in your life. But here's the crazy thing. Even though that sounds so good to us, even like, yes, I want that so bad, it starts to make our hearts race to think about resting, doesn't it? I mean, let's just be honest for a moment. How many of you are stressed about resting right now? You're going to tell me to not work for a while, like maybe even a whole day, like that starts to freak me out. That, those are important hours that I got to do, like work on the bathroom. I got to check emails. Like it starts to create anxiety in us to think about stopping work. That might be an indication that something is awry, right? Here's the reason, okay? Genesis chapter one is the high level view of God's creation. You know, he created everything. Genesis chapter two, second chapter of the Bible, is like zooming in on his creation of mankind in his image. Genesis chapter three is when sin enters the world. It's the first time that people rejected God, pushed him away, said, I'd rather try life on my own apart from you. And in that moment when sin is brought into our world, it sends shockwaves of disruption and destruction through our world. And one of the consequences that God names is that work will become painful. That it will feel like toil. It will be exhausting and frustrating and hard and painful at times. You've probably felt that. Whether you work with your hands and you feel the exhaustion in your bones or whether you work with your mind and it just drains you of all energy, you know that work sometimes just wears you out, right? And this, something else happened in that moment. It's not just that work became painful, but that rest became elusive, that it would be something that we're always grasping after and struggling to find. And so every generation since, including us, has felt the pain of work and the struggle of rest. There's a moment in history when God's people lived in a culture of compulsive work. It's a mouthful. They lived in a culture that overvalued work and productivity, okay? So God chose this family to have a special relationship with, and, and over generations, that family became a great people, a nation. They were known as the nation of Israel, and Israel is captured and put into slavery in the nation of Egypt. So they are this minority group of people living as slaves, forced to do harsh and unending labor, and they, they are just worn out. They're frustrated. They're fatigued, and they are begging for a break. In fact, what they ask for, they go to their leader, I mean, named Pharaoh, and they say, Pharaoh, can we please have just a few days, just a weekend retreat? Can we just go out to the wilderness to worship our God? Pharaoh goes, no way. They're like, please, just give us a couple days. He goes, no, there's work to be done. All work, no worship. Get back to work. And so they, they have no choice. They are slaves. They are oppressed. And so they start to call out to their God, God, please save us. We long to stop working. We long to worship you. Would you rescue us? God intervenes. He sets them free through the series of signs and wonders, miracles. They're set free. They go out and then God begins to develop a relationship with them in this covenant where he offers them promises. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll be your God. And here's what I want from you. Here's my expectation of you. And he delivers his expectation through what we know as the Ten Commandments. This set of guidelines that will lead them into life at its best. And you know what lives right at the heart of those commands? Let me read it to you. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day, that's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, or any foreigner residing in you. You feel the, the, the comprehensiveness of this command? It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in it, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. We might hear that and be like, does that really belong in the Ten Commandments? I mean, with like murder and adultery. Does that really belong there? I need you to understand that by placing this on God's top ten list, it must be important to him, right? He chose ten commands. He could have filled it up. It could have been twenty, a hundred. But he said, these are the ten that should guide you. This is complete. And within that, he said, honor the Sabbath. Keep a day of rest. Not only that, but this actually happens to be the longest of all the commands. It comprises one-third of the entire Ten Commandments in terms of length. It's the only command God gives with a reason attached to it. He doesn't say don't murder because or don't commit adultery because, but he says keep the Sabbath because God worked for six days and then he rested, so you should too. I think that the whole reason for this is because, remember, these people had lived in a culture of compulsive work. They had been trained and conditioned to work nonstop, to feel guilty and even fearful if they would stop. They didn't even know how to rest or worship anymore. And so God is saying, you're not slaves to work anymore. I've rescued you from that. You don't have to do that anymore. I've set you free to worship me, to delight in the life I've given you. So don't run back into this compulsiveness. Don't run back into continual work that prevents you from worshiping me. I've given you something better than that, church. We live in a culture of compulsive work, and we need to hear the same message that a lack of rest keeps us from enjoying the life God gives us. I believe that. A life, excuse me, a lack of rest keeps us from enjoying the life God gives us. You look around and you know that our society worships productivity, doesn't it? Like you know within your company that the more time you give, the more you'll be rewarded. And if you want any chance of keeping up or getting ahead, then you're going to have to give more, more hours, more energy, more time, more time away from your family, more time out of town. Like you just know that it's going to demand more for you to keep moving up. And that's always the goal. And, and it's as if we celebrate busyness as this badge of honor. We wear it around. Like when people ask how you're doing, you, you act like you're a little bit embarrassed by it, but you offer, I, I'm, I'm just really busy because it makes you feel important. And we see rest as a sign of weakness and we're passing this on to our children. We're signing them up for everything, every sports league, every club, every commitment. We're just saying the busier you are, the better life is. And we're just living in this reckless cycle of work. Now think about this. If an entire culture rejected one of God's commands, I believe that that culture would then become a miserable society. I mean, think about this for a second. Imagine a culture that completely rejected the command for children to be trained to honor their parents. So children ran the home. They had all the authority. They were disrespectful, disobedient, disruptive, destructive. Like, just name it. Like, can you imagine an entire culture that lived like that? It'd be miserable, wouldn't it? Imagine a culture where no one honored the command to be truthful and trustworthy. Like everyone was completely dishonest. You couldn't trust a single thing anyone said. They all lied or said whatever they wanted for their own benefit. Like there was just no honor for the truth. Can you imagine how terrible, how miserable of a society that would be? Like we could just go down the list of God's commands. If someone, if an entire culture rejected it, it would lead to a miserable culture. And what has happened in our world is that we have entirely rejected one of these commands. We've said, I don't, I don't want anything to do with a day of rest. I don't want anything to do with a rhythm of rest. I got a work to do. And what I would like to suggest is that unknowingly, it has created a culture that is miserable. That there is this increase in sleeplessness and anxiety and depression and discontent. There's this increase in irritability and impatience. There's this increase in comparing ourselves to one another and fear and stress and even panic. There's this increase in all of these negative things. And at the same time, there's this decrease in joy. 
There's this decrease in purpose. There's this decrease in contentment and friendship and laughter and love and intimacy and worship. So church, like, don't you think that it's possible that by completely dismissing one of God's commands, we are living in this miserable society and we don't even know it? I think that the greatest cost of this is two things. Because, and both of them are relational because relationships cannot exist at that pace. And so what happens is it negatively affects our relationship with God and worship becomes inconvenient. If you've ever thought, do, do I really have time to go worship God today? I mean, I, I've got projects to do. I got errands to run. I just need a break from all of it. Like, if you've ever thought that, it's because you are keeping a pace that is messing up your relationship with God. A relationship can't thrive at that pace. It has the same effect on your relationships with others. It makes worship inconvenient, and it makes people feel like an interruption. Like, I don't have time to have dinner with them. I don't have time for this phone call. I don't have time to return this text. I don't have time for small group. All of that just interrupts my life, and I don't have any margin for that. That's what happens when we lack a rhythm of rest. A couple of months ago, I went out to California, had the opportunity to travel out there to, um, to, to coach a church planter um, as a part of a church that we are helping to start down in San Diego. It's, it's going to launch actually in just two weeks from today. It's really exciting. And so we're going to keep telling you information about this in the coming weeks as we celebrate their launch. But while I was out there for that, I was able to travel up to LA to see a good friend of mine. We grew up together. We, we were in youth group together. Uh, we spent a couple years at college together. And then we are now on opposite coasts, both serving as pastors and churches. And so I drove up for the whole purpose of spending time with him. There's a whole reason I was there. And so I told him uh, as I was heading toward him, hey, I had a whole day of meetings. I'd really like um, just just to get outside to get a little exercise. So he's like, oh, good. I know a hike that we can do. And so we drove to this trail and we get out of the car and he looks at me and he says, every once in a while, I like to run this trail. You want to run this trail? And I'm like, yeah, I run mountains every day in Rhode Island, right? Like, that's my thing. Like, let's do this. Like a buddy from high school, I don't want him to think that I'm like old and out of shape, so I'm going to do this, right? And so we start jogging. And and early on, like, we're we're just talking about our family, our kids, the churches, like uh, all of this, but you know how it goes. Like, after a short time, like breathing increases and talking decreases. And one of us, I won't say who, is like, hey, you want to you don't want to just walk for a minute? I'm like, yeah, that that sounds like a great idea. I need to tie my shoe and I think I'm going to die, right? (laughs) So let's do that. And so we walk for a minute and then then, uh, we're like, well, you know, let's run again. And so we start running. I'm like, all the way to the top this time. And then we stop and, and we realize that as long as we are moving at that pace, we cannot enjoy the relationship. And that's the whole reason I'm there. That we had started moving at a pace that was keeping us from enjoying the whole purpose that we were there. I wonder how many of us are moving at a pace that is keeping us from enjoying the whole reason we are here. You are here for really two reasons. To worship God and to live in relationship. That's why God created you in his image. Worship him, enjoy him, delight in him, give him praise, and live in a loving community this strengthens your faith. Jesus at one point was asked, what, what are the greatest commandments? And he said this, he said, it's really simple. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as yourself. Love God, love people. That's why you're here. It's what existed in the Garden of Eden before sin messed everything up. It's what we will enjoy in heaven for all of eternity after sin is removed. Jesus said, this is why you're here. Love God, love people. But here's the problem. We are moving at a pace that keeps us from enjoying the entire reason that we're here. Don't have time to worship God. We don't have a desire to connect in meaningful community. We need a different pace. Are you with me? And so this is where we get into asking the question, then how do I implement a rhythm of rest in my life in this culture? And I will say this, as you start to walk into this, This will challenge you and it will feel uncomfortable because you will be exercising a muscle that has not been moved in a long time. 
It will feel a little difficult. It'll feel awkward. The first couple weeks will probably not feel like it pays off at all. But we trust God that he knows better than we do. And we really don't have a whole lot to lose other than this crazy and chaotic life anyway, right? And so we're going to walk into this and ask, what does it mean for us to have a rhythm of rest? I'm going to start with this. You need a full day of rest each week. You need a full day of rest each week. So I don't think that we have to be legalistic about this. Jesus said that Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, meaning don't lose the heart of this. This is for the good and the benefit and the enjoyment of God's people. And so don't turn it into another set of rules that feels just like work and steals the joy of life. But the point is that if God rested and he commanded us to rest, then maybe we should rest, right? And so I think you need a full day of rest each week. I think I need a full day of rest each week. And so this can look very different for each of us. It's not that we all have to have the exact same day of rest or do it the same way. One way that you can do it is just to say that for me and my family, this day is the day that we rest. Maybe it's Saturday. Maybe it's Sunday. Maybe based on your work schedule, it's got to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It does not matter. And maybe even within your family, you have different work schedules. And so it's for you, it's one day. And for your spouse, it's another. That's okay. Don't think about it in terms of rules or restrictions. See, the, the Jews practiced it like this. On Friday evening, they would share a meal with their family. They would relax. They would go to bed. And then the next day, they would not work until sunset. So from sunset to sunset, meal to meal, they would rest 24 hours to enjoy what God has given them. So maybe that's it for you. I think if I were in your situation, or if I had maybe more of a normal rhythm, I'd love to start our, our, our rhythm of rest on a Saturday evening with a meal, and then we just hang out, maybe enjoy time with friends, go to bed, get up the next morning, worship our God, maybe even serve within the church because Jesus helped others and did what was good for others during his Sabbath and then just enjoy the rest of the day with our family doing something we love. I think that'd be great. But maybe you've noticed like Sunday's a bit of a work day for my family. And so it doesn't really work out like that. And so we're, we're trying to back it up and basically have that rhythm from Friday evening to Saturday evening. We're, we're still testing it out and figuring out what works. The point is, I believe that you need a day of rest. And that leads to this question, what do I do on that day? How do I make that day what it's supposed to be? And so um, I've been studying a lot about this. I've come across a simple way to think about this. I'm going to offer you four characteristics or four four ways to to make your day of rest what it needs to be. And so I'd really encourage you to write this down. I think you need this even more than you want. And so if you don't write this down, I'm assuming that you don't love God or respect his word, okay? Like we're just going to say that, all right? (laughs) So, so you can just write this down, even if it's to impress the person next to you. Fine. <laughs> Here's what you can do with your day of rest. On that day, you should first stop. Okay? On your day of rest, you should stop. I mean, stop work of all kinds. So, no house projects. No finishing the bathroom remodel. No work emails. Even if you're in the restroom and you think no one knows, like we, we know that that happens, okay? Like no work, okay? No thinking about work, no worrying about work, no doing work, just rest. This obviously takes a little bit of preparation because it means that that day can't be the day that you run all of your errands and do all of your stuff. And I would actually suggest from personal experience, don't try to go shopping. We tried to do that. We went to Target on a Saturday. Not restful, Okay. <laughs> No surprise, right? So like no work, no worrying, no wanting, no wishing. We spend enough time throughout the rest of our week knowing what still needs to be done and focusing on that. This is a day for you to think about not what you wish you had or what you're trying to accumulate, but to focus on what you already have because of God's goodness in your life. So you just stop. Don't work. Number two, you rest. And what I mean by rest is that you do whatever refills you. You do whatever refills you, whatever replenishes you. And this is different for all of us. But before I talk about examples, I need to distinguish between rest and leisure, which our culture has confused. Okay? Leisure is just taking your mind off of things for an indefinite period of time and then returning with the same fatigue or frustration that you had before. 
So like Netflix binging or watching nine hours of football or surfing social media for a couple hours or playing video games is not rest because it doesn't refill your tank. It just distracts you. Therefore, it's leisure. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whatever makes you feel more whole at the end of the day. So maybe for you, it's going outside and enjoying the beauty of God's creation. That was the first Sabbath. Maybe for you, it's finding a hobby that that is active, going for walks or skiing or riding bikes. Maybe for you, because of your personality, what you really need is just a a slow day where you sit by a fire or you drink a cup of coffee, you read a book, you take a nap, you feel recharged. I think that it will probably include spending time with people you love either family or friends, because that's part of the blessing that God has brought into your life. And I know that this gets really complicated, with, especially with little kids in the house. And so it's not going to be exactly like what you want it to be, but the point is that your whole family figures out a way to have a different pace, to not be a slave to productivity, because God has rescued you from that. So you stop and you rest. And ultimately, this should lead you to the third thing, which is d- delight. That if you are engaging in a healthy rhythm of rest, at the end of that day, it will cause you to enjoy what God has given you more. The days when my family has done this well, we get to the end of the day and I'm just like, man, I love my family. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love where we live. I love being active. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for the job that God has given us that allows us to do things. Like It just creates this delight in life. And there is delight to be had no matter what your life circumstance, no matter what kind of situation you're in, how much or how little you have, there's something to delight in because God is good. And so your Sabbath, your day of rest should lead you to delighting in what he's given you. Isn't it a travesty that some of the greatest blessings in your life feel like frustrations at different times? That the kids or the house or the work or even the spouse or the friends or the church or whatever it is, that at some point it feels like this burden to you? Isn't that crazy? It's because we are moving at a pace that gives us the wrong perspective. We need to slow down to delight in what you have. And that leads to the last thing, which is worship. So when you stop, and when you rest, when you delight, it will lead you to worship because you are more aware of the good in your life and you are more appreciative to the one from whom it has come. So that means that as part of your day of rest, you may put on some worship music and just sing it out in your house because you were so thankful. It may mean that you read a book that draws your attention to God or you spend a little more time in scripture and prayer. It should certainly cause you to have a greater desire to get together with other people who are just as thankful as you are to the good God who has given us goodness and beauty in all of our lives. It should cause us to want to worship The whole purpose of the rhythm of rest initially was to create space to worship God. Think how crazy it is that sometimes we think that rest is the reason we shouldn't worship. He calls you to delight in him and then to give him credit for all the good that he has done by worshiping on your own and with his church. We know that life needs a different pace, don't we? Don't you feel it? And it feels like a risk, a sacrifice to give up a day that could be used to catch up, to clean up, to make progress. But isn't our entire faith built on trusting that God knows better than we do? And it's only when we get to these pressure points that really test that, that we show how much we trust him more than ourselves. And so here's my challenge for you. You need a day of rest. that that leads you to delight in the life God has given you, to enjoy the life he's given you, and to worship him for it. You need a day of rest that gives you margin so that your life is characterized by worship and community, the whole reason you're here. So my challenge for you is this. For four weeks, make a commitment that you will talk with the people in your household and you will identify a day that you will set aside as holy to the Lord, a day of rest. Four weeks. Try it out. It's not going to come easy. But I promise you that eventually, if you trust God, you will see the fruit and the blessing of this rhythm in your life. Stop. Rest. Delight. Worship. You need to ask these questions. When's it going to be? 
What do I need to stop? And then what does it mean for me to rest and delight and worship God? I absolutely believe that this will lead you further into the life you've been longing for. It's the life you were created for. It's the life God commanded you into. I promise you it will be the life that is more satisfying than the one that you have right now. If only you will trust God and follow his ways. Father God, I pray that you would lead us into the life you've created us for. Give us the trust to do what you've commanded. And I pray that as a result, we would rest and worship you more, that we would be more open to loving you and loving the people around us. God, please silence the lies of the enemy who wants to tell us that this is impossible or that this can't be done or it's impractical or it's not beneficial. Just help us to hear the voice uh, of truth from you, God. We trust you and we love you and we know that our lives are full of goodness and we want to enjoy that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to get a taste of this right now. And so we're going to stand and we are going to sing about how good God has been to us. If that is true, would you?